This is Internet Marketing. Hello and welcome to the Internet Marketing Podcast brought to you by Site Visibility. I'm your host, Scott Colnut, and with me today is Kevin Yurutia, co-founder and CEO of Voy Media. And we're going to be talking about simplifying your marketing for faster growth. Thanks for joining me, Kevin. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Super excited to be here. So you have a very storied career so far. You've been a developer. You're a co-founder of a marketing agency. Uh, you have Chester Travels, which is in luggage. You have Made Sailors, which is for a home cleaning business in New York. There's so much that you've done, but how would you introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, so yeah, my background is diverse, but basically I started off with programming and the reason why I started programming and, and web development is because growing up, I really wanted to make games and that was something I was like really addicted to growing up was just like, playing games and making just like video games in general. But really, most of it was kind of like web games. I was really big into like, this 2D like web browser games. And that's really what got me into this sort of like learning about programming, learning about development. And I remember playing this game it was called Secrets of War, which is like a kind of like a literally a 2D based game where you just like move around like through your keyboard. But that concept of like talking to people online and collaborating with people really kind of just was like very unique for me at the time because at this time it was like maybe 15 years ago. I was just like that was like unique, but at the same time, it was very weird because like I remember my parents telling me like, why are you talking to people online, right? Like, that's like a weird thing to do. But now it's like so obvious, right? Um, mm. And that's really where I got uh, kind of got started with. And that really, uh, even for that one, I was maybe about 16 at the time. I emailed the person creating the game and was just like, hey, how do you make me this thing, right? And he told me, he's like, oh, I did like C Sharp. And, I, and then that's when I was like, oh, what is this programming thing? And that's when I learned books and I picked up C++. Uh, like one of those like for dummies books. And then I realized that C++ was more like backend stuff. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do backend stuff. I really want to do like the visual stuff, the stuff that people see and the way you can interact. And then that's when I learned about HTML and CSS. And that's when I was like, oh yeah, this is exactly what I want to do. Like I want to be doing web stuff where people can touch and interact and you can actually see your product versus like the backend stuff that's important. But I just like don't, that, but it's not what I want to do. And then that's kind of early where I, I started lear- uh, learning more about programming. And then I went to college for computer science in Binghamton. And that's, this is really where I started even just thinking more about doing my own startups, doing my own thing. Because um, I was really, at that time, I was really big into reading about TechCrunch, tech news, and just saying like, oh, you got to go to Silicon Valley to really experience this. You got to go to Silicon Valley to raise money, to start your company. And really that whole like, mindset of like why combinator hacker news all that stuff about like tech was what i was like super interested in and everything i did in college was to sort of try to go to silicon valley i interned at like an incubator which is kind of like a place where people go in to build start startups and i was working with a few companies there and in new york city it was a it was called like era entrepreneurs roundtable accelerator and i was i was an intern there and really was like because i wanted to learn more about startups and it was great because at this sort of incubator for an internship Randomly, in this internship, I just really applied on Craigslist and they got it. And I was like, oh, I met all these like great VCs like Fred Wilson from like Union Square Ventures, like a top VC in New York City. And he would come in and talk. And I was like, whoa, like this is like great. This is what I want to do. And then uh, and that was like a summer internship there. And then I went back to college and that summer, uh, sorry, that, that, that winter in college, I started a web development agency called One Tiny Bit with my friend Wilson. And then we were really building Ruby on Rails apps, iPhone apps for other people. And we were just like trying to find customers on Craigslist and pitching them. And so early on, like when I was like doing this at that time, I didn't realize like this was also kind of marketing. But for us, it was just like, hey, we want to find clients. How do we get to do it? And then we're just like, oh, let's just go go to Craigslist because I think there's people there. So that's kind of like how I started kind of thinking about marketing. But really more marketing came to me when me and Wilson were like building stuff, building apps, websites. And we just could never like get customers. Like we're just realizing like, hey, like we're building this cool thing, but like how come people don't use our apps? Besides like <laughs> you probably know Scott, like your friends that use it for like a day and it's like, okay, cool, thank you. And it's like, no, I'm like, can you keep using it? Like I, I want you to it's actually a good app. So that's kind of like how I got more into like 
entrepreneurship and, and marketing once I kind of like realized that like, hey, I can build something, but I just can't bring customers to, to, to my app. There's lots to unpack there, and it's a good discussion about this development, early development career. And actually, I say early development career. I know that you're still involved in development, so it's not like that. It's not like you've lost those skills and you no longer apply those skills. But it was that that was your full time focus back then. I'm really interested to the fact that you started through an interest in essentially video games, <laughs> and then you learned the skills because you wanted to create the thing that you had seen or used. So I'm interested to know just from your perspective, having been on the development side, I think you said you achieved a computer science degree and then moved into an internship. Do you think that computer science skills are something that come naturally to to people? So if it's an unnatural skill, do you think it's easy to learn or is it quite difficult? And was it ever natural for you? Yeah, I think computer science skills, it's a good question because when I was in college, I thought computer science was wasn't too crazy hard. Um, at least a lot of it was kind of like just problem solving. But I had some friends in college that were like really, really great programmers or just like computer scientists essentially that just got it. And it was like a natural like skill of problem solving they were able to get. Whereas at the same time, I had other friends who were computer science majors and I was just like, I was looking at them struggle. I was like, whoa, like you just don't get it. And I think it's like anything, like sometimes you just don't get things and it doesn't mean that like you can't do it. It's just like, there's people that are just going to be better at it. For example, like when I was working at Zarly, one guy that was working there, he didn't even have a degree or didn't go to computer science, but he was a much better program than me. And he just, because he just got it. Like he could just see things. And it's like, whoa, like it's crazy. Like some people, it's, it's anything. Like you can learn it for sure. And I think there's like that big movement now of like boot camps, right? We're like, hey, learn computer science or learn programming. And I'm talking to some friends and some friends are like, oh yeah, this is really easy. I get it. But some friends are like, whoa, this is so hard. Like, I have no clue what to do. Like, I don't even know, like, what's going on with this, like, programming thing. Like, I can't even get it, right? But I think it's, Mm -hmm. a lot of it has to do, if I think about, I tell people, like, a lot of it just really has to do with, like, problem solving. And I think computer science is that, like, thing where it's like, hey, here's a a widget. How do you build it? And then you really have to, like, deconstruct it and then learn how to problem solve and learn how to, like, sort of, look at problems. You're kind of like a, kind of like a, I mean, literally like a scientist answers about all computer science, right? So it's like, you really have to like think about it like that. Another thing that made me smile as you were talking is that you were describing that early, that early stage you go through sometimes in a career where all of your knowledge and learning is accelerating really fast. But it very quickly sounds to me that I think you described something like Hacker News or TechCrunch and you start getting it's like a, the motivation builds, the obsession builds. And and funnily enough, I tie it back in with gaming because Silicon Valley is like the final boss or that's the start, that's the very first level depending on how you look at it. But I guess that becomes, I guess Silicon Valley very quickly becomes the goal once you get into that marketing, computer science obsession really and, and you become motivated by that. Is that how it felt for you at the time was Silicon Valley, did that very quickly become the goal? That that was exactly what you said. It was like it's crazy because like it literally was an obsession. Like I remember just like checking the news, like t- hack news, like twenty four seven, like refreshing. Like if I miss an article, you're like, oh my god, I can't believe I missed that, right? And it's like that weird obsession where you're just like constantly just checking what's happening or who's raising money, who's doing a startup, what new language is coming out, what new programming language you got to learn. It's like a crazy, crazy obsession that like, people sometimes don't understand. Like I don't know, I just like you're just like, addicted to it because it's like. That like, oh, whoa, there's a new language. Let me go Let me go experiment. Oh, there's a new GitHub repo with a project. Let me go download it and, and try that language. And yeah, it's like, it was crazy because Silicon Valley was the goal. And then after college, I did go out to Silicon Valley because I went to work for Mint.com. I went to work for Zarly. And that was in Silicon Valley. And when I went there, it was like, I tell people all the time, it's exactly what I thought it would be. It's like, everybody's talking about tech. Everybody's programming. Everybody's doing these hackathons, competitions. It's like, you're there with your tribe of people. That are doing everything you want to do. Like even when I was in college, trying to do like a startup or start something, ten years ago, like people were like, "Why are you doing that? Like, why don't you just go out on the weekends?" And I was just like, "No, I don't want to do that. Like, I really want to do something. I want to start something, right?" Mm. And then when I went to Silicon Valley, it's like that's the normal. So like, if you're not doing that, it's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it because it gets in your veins and it's, it's hard it's, to shake the bug for it. It's a crazy obsession. And I'm like, yeah, it's like crazy because like, if you think about it, like, yeah, I didn't even think about it until like you told me like, yeah, it's actually an obsession. Like you be like, you don't realize how glued you are to your screen uh, to just get that next like article uh, online that you want to read. 
And in hindsight, do you think that was positive for your career? Or are there things to do with that era of your career that you would look back on and think, ah, oh, actually, that was a bit of wasted time? I think for like, I think it, I think it's questions like, just like two ways, like career wise. Yeah, great. I, I love everything I did. Love it. Like as in like personal relationship wise and probably like, you know, love wise, probably not because like you become so addicted to like what you're doing that you don't make the best sound decisions about like mm-hmm. people you're with or who you're hanging out with. Um, just because it's like, hey, I want to hang out. I'm like, no, I want to read this article. So it's like a weird obsession, right? And on this note, I do want to, it will help build a picture for me and our listeners moving on to some of these, essentially you then became your business owner after your time in Silicon Valley. So maybe can you speak on the projects that you worked on as a developer while you were in Silicon Valley? I think you mentioned Mint.com, Zali, and speak on the projects that you worked on and then how that eventually transitioned into your businesses. Yeah, so when I was at Mint.com, I was working on the front end development team. So I was like I said, like I re- I still was doing computer science, but I still want to really do a lot of the front end dev-, dev because even in college, I was also doing I was also a graphic designer minor because I still love like that visual aspect of of things. So when I was at Mint, I was working on this project called like Mint Julep or something. I think if I remember correctly, and basically what we did there was we were just rebuilding the whole front end of Mint.com when you were logging in through your bank. And making and converting into like a single page uh, web app, and that's kind of what we were doing there. That Mint at the time was very old school, and we were trying to make it more modern with uh, better JavaScript interactions, better UI interactions, the data loading in the background. I remember we're learning about like Bootstrap JS back then, of like how to bring in like a dynamic library into the system that you can just kickstart like a single page app, and then all, kind of like very early jQuery stuff that we were doing there. So that was pretty fun because the team, the, the team, like it was like kind of transitioning from the old code, bit, old code base to like a new modern one, and that was interesting because I was working with like a lot of experienced developers. But at the same time, I tell people all the time, like when I was working at Mint.com, that was very like corporate at the time. It was already being brought up by Intuit, so my job there was like very nine to five, and probably you can tell like I didn't want that. I wanted like that crazy sort of lifestyle of working all the time. When I went to San Francisco, so basically after like less than a year, I left because I was like, this is a great job. I love it here. Great benefits, like great pay. But this isn't what I want when I'm like 22 years old. I want to go somewhere else where it's like crazy and hectic. And that's when I went to Zarly. And so when I was at Zarly, this was also in San Francisco. And really when I was doing at Zarly, I was more doing kind of like a more of a full stack engineer, uh, which is the front end stuff. But again, also doing my own back end stuff with like, the databases and, and the Ruby on Rails. So that, I like this a lot better because you, you got the full sort of spectrum of like kind of building a feature from like top to bottom versus like at, when I was at Mint, it was like I would just do the front end and then I would have to talk to the back end team to be like, hey, I need this API. Um, can you give it to me? And then let me know when it's done. So here I was I was doing a lot more. My boss at, at Zarly allowed me to do pretty much everything. And But really here at Zarly, this is when I got more into marketing because I was when I first joined, I joined kind of like the marketing sort of department of this, of like helping the marketing team implement a lot of these like tags, right? Like these the tracking tags, these like email tags, these sort of like uh, cookies. And it was interesting for me because I was like doing this. I was like, oh, this is in- this is interesting because like this is pretty easy to do. I was like, I'm wondering why the marketing team can't do it, right? I'm like, and that's kind of like what might me like learn more about marketing. I was like, oh, like maybe I can learn marketing because like, why can't I was for me? It was just like naive, like oh, why can't they do this? Right, this is so easy, right? So mm-hmm. that's what I was doing at Darley, and then at Darley too, we were doing a lot of the the checkout flow. So how do people check out? I was working on that with the teams, and there we had like a pod structure where we had like a front end guy, a designer, and then like you know a full stack engineer like me to help sort of like implement that feature. So interesting that you touched on the fact that you're working as a developer, you're understanding more about marketing. And then your curiosity leads you to question, hey, why can't the marketing guys do some of these things? Because that leads on to something that I wanted to ask you about anyway. In marketing, I know a number of our listeners, I know our agency, Site Visibility, there are always the challenges that come up in the marketing career of marketers want to do one thing, they need developers' support sometimes to implement that thing, or sometimes there's a developer out there that really wants to experiment with this brand new thing, doesn't know the marketing impact of that thing. When those two worlds collide, sometimes there can be 
uh, friction. Sometimes it can be difficult. Sometimes the communication isn't great. And I'm just really curious from your experience if there's any advice you could give to either marketers, developers, or both about working together and improving their relationships. Yeah, and I think this is a, this is a great question too because when I was at Zarly, I really wanted to like get us thinking about like SE, and this is I think this is like any team, like even design team um, too. When I was working at Zarly, like towards my end of, of working there, I really wanted to think about SEO for the company because I was like, hey, like uh, Zarly is kind of like a home services company. I was looking at companies like um, Angie's List, right? Uh, Thumbtack. It's basically a competitor to us, and I was like. Just basically at this time, I was already researching like marketing strategy. I'm like, how are these companies just like getting so much traffic, or how are they getting so many new visitors, right? And there's so many tools out there like SEMrush, um, you know, Ahrefs to sort of see that. And I was like, oh wow, like this company is doing a lot of like SEO stuff. And I was like, I was like, why can't we do that? And then that's really when I was like talking to my boss. I was like, hey, like I really want to do this like SEO initiative for the company. And that was like a crazy like. Oh my god! Like I was talking to designers, and they're like, "No, we're not doing that. Like we're not adding these links here." I'm like, "No, like, but we need to make sure the links say like, you know, home cleaning versus you know, get a get a home served now." I'm like, this is, "I'm like, because I'm, I'm I'm just trying to think about the best practices that I'm reading online, right?" I'm like, "This is what people think you should do, but how come our verbiage on the website isn't that right?" And that's just one of those things where you just did like. I, and it's tough because like, even for me, I had a really hard time trying to be like, no, like this is the right way. Like this little fancy way of jargon that we're saying it, no one understands. It, and this is why we're not getting any SEO traffic because no one describes a product or service that way. And at least for me, like as I've gone, learn more about marketing, I think being very clear and concise with your, with a your messaging is so important versus like that unique lingo or unique verbiage that a company sometimes want to use. I'm like, if no one understands what you're saying, then Google can't find you because you still want to attract the masses, which is people search for very, very basic keywords on Google, um, at least if you're thinking about SEO that way. And I think, at least for me, I was pretty much saying like, hey, just give me a shot. Like, Let me try this. And if it doesn't work out, we can just reverse the code and do it again. But I think the better way to do it is like truly try to get them to understand like why it's important. And again, for me, just like doing more things, it's like showing case studies. Like, hey, look, a company was doing this before. They implemented these features. And now they're, you know, their traffic grew this way. Um, but I think like anything, it's always a, a tough sort of sell. And that's why sometimes like people like get frustrated and leave companies. It's like, oh, like I know what to do. I, I, if we did this, it would be so much better, right? So. Mm. One thing I hadn't really thought about until you've just been speaking it through is that I guess there's such an emphasis in somewhere like Silicon Valley. You talked about, you know, working nonstop f- to create. I think you've referenced that a couple of times. The, the goal is to just create the thing that you want to create and get it out into the world. And you'll be able to tell me from your experience there. Does that mean that in Silicon Valley, sometimes that a lot of these product-based and particularly SaaS-based products or services, do they lose their focus on marketing because they're so caught up in the creating the best product possible that they forget the marketing part and they forget yeah. the end user? Yeah, and I think I think what you said is a good question. And really, when I was in Silicon Valley and when I was first starting off my first businesses, I thought it was just completely completely based on product. Like if you have a great product, you're going to win, right? And that's really what the mantra was for Silicon Valley during that time. And and I also believe that. I was thinking about, I never thought about marketing. When I thought about marketing back then, it was like, ew, like why would you ever do marketing? If you're, you only do marketing if your product sucks, right? You probably heard that. Like, I literally like, would always hear that in Silicon Valley. But then as I sort of like started thinking more about it, I was like, no, like you actually need marketing to like bring customers and bring uh, bring traffic, which is funny because now I think it's the opposite. Like people know that the product isn't isn't important as much anymore, as much as the marketing is. Because, and the reason why I say it's because back then, when you had a product or a SaaS, it was very unique because there was only maybe one of them. But now, when you have like a SaaS or product, you probably know Scott. There's like 20 clones that pop up the next month, right? So what makes mm-hmm. you different now is going to be the marketing. That's really interesting. And it leads me on to the fact you've just talked about essentially competition and the growth of SaaS products. And one thing I wanted to talk about is the no code community and movement. I'm actually speaking very shortly to someone that's in that space. And I was curious to hear someone that's come from a development background about your opinion on the no code community and no code movement and the no code products that are out there now. Do you think that's going to be good for marketers in general moving forward the pro as i see it is that it gives more freedom for people to create products that maybe don't come from development backgrounds but the downside as you've kind of just alluded to 
is that it means there there's going to be a lot more competition and actually it might be hard to judge the quality of products that new products that are being built. Yeah, I think the no code movement it's great. I think it's it reminds me of just like I don't know, I just think it's interesting with the no code movement. And I think it's finally people understanding like what programming is or like what tech is. It's kind of like I tell people all the time, like, hey, you use your cell phone, like an iPhone, right, or Android. And it's crazy, like, people just don't know, like, how much tech or development went into making this thing that, like, mm. people complain that it sucks, right? <laughs> like, oh, this phone sucks. I'm like, no, like, this is, like, a great engineering feat of, like, a computer in your phone, right? And, like, us as engineers, we, like, understand that. And I think with this no-code movement, I think it's helpful for people to see how do you build things and how do you build products or things. And, and then it really opens up their mind of what's possible because once they maybe will build something and they can see the limitations of no code because there's probably some right they can then maybe go into learn about programming and this will just make people like want to actually do more programming and it, it reminds me of like probably like MySpace back in the day right when everybody was mm. like oh I want to do like music in my background I want to do all like hide my friends that kind of inherently taught people a little bit about HTML and CSS and the people that were doing that then went on to become developers who's like oh this is kind of cool right. It's like a great sort of entryway without being too scary. I really love that comparison. I'd never really thought about the comparison to MySpace, but it it does remind me at the moment of that era, the the momentum behind what no code is about. And yeah, I'm just thinking back to kind of embedding things and playing with CSS. And hey, it's a it's like a playground for for you to learn all of those skills, and you can take that wherever you want to take it. So I think that's a, a really good comparison. I want to transition into some of your personal businesses so perhaps you can tell me the story of you're in silicon valley you're working at zali and other companies and then uh, when does the when did the entrepreneurial skills come into play when did you decide right now I'm, i've got the the time to launch my own businesses talk me through that process yeah so i was i was in silicon valley for about three and a half four years and really by like even when, even when i was in silicon valley i still had like I was still like building stuff and I still wanted to like make things. So me and Wilson were, Wilson's my partner. We do a lot of stuff together and we went to college together, but he was also in Silicon Valley. So we were always competing on things, not, not, to, not against each other, but like competing in competitions. Uh, we were always like launching startups. We were trying to make like a flower on demand company. We we're trying to make an early blue apron, like really like, like I said, building stuff. So like the entrepreneurial bug was always there. And then after like essentially four years, I kind of just wanted to just be like, I think now is the time for me to just go and do something. And mm. after four years, I was like missing home. So I was like, I'm just going to move back home to, to New York. Um, my initial plan was like, I'm going to live in the city because I, I live in Long Island, but I've never lived in the city. And obviously anybody lives in New York. It's like your goal is to like live in the city, which is New York City. But once I went back home, I realized I didn't have enough money. So I decided to just live with my mom. And for that full year, I was then focusing on building maid sailors. And the reason I, why I started the maid company was because during this time, I was kind of doing like, remember what I said before, I was like kind of looking at SEO. I was like just reading about it. People were saying like, hey, if you want to make a business, you want to make some sort of company, you should be really looking about traffic volume or keyword volume that can show you if there's actually demand for product or service, which is completely different than how I thought about things before I knew about marketing. Because back then... I would just make something and be like, oh, this is a good idea. Let me go make it, right? But right. now when I'm thinking about businesses and products to make, I always think about, okay, is there actual demand for this? And then I saw that this home cleaning thing was something that I could do. And it wasn't like, it wasn't something sexy, but I was reading about, I forgot, but I was reading a book saying, hey, like start like a service-based business because it allows for cash flow, but also allows for you just to learn about making a company, making payroll, hiring people, kind of like all the fund- fundamental skills of that you need in a business no matter what you make. So that's when I started Made Sailors. And when I first started Made Sailors, I was really thinking about, oh, I'm going to apply all my programming skills to this. I'm going to make a custom checkout, I'm make a custom funnel, all this stuff. And really quickly early on, I was like, whoa, I have no time to be building the software and I also have no money to be hiring a developer. I'm just going to go to WordPress and I'm going to get like one of those like plugins about like calendar and also just checkout with Stripe. And that's really how I, I, that's how the company was for about a year until like much later on, we were able to, we were able to find software to help us build, to build like a better system. Um, it was called like launch 27. It's like a custom software for made companies. Um, but here for the made company, this is really where I learned everything I knew about like marketing and SEO and hiring email marketing. And really the company right now is really built on top of SEO, which is like the early thing I learned. And then later on we added everything else like paid traffic, we added Google ads, Facebook ads, 
Um, we also added like more like Yelp reviews and we realized like a, building a business was more than just like the idea. It's like everything else surrounding it. Like the people you hire, how do you fire people? How do you like talk to people? How do you like customer service? Like I was remember like, I remember picking up calls at like 6 7 PM to be someone booking a cleaning. I was like, Oh my God, like I just want to sleep. But in the beginning, like you, you have to do everything yourself because you don't, you don't have like a customer service rep, rep team. And then eventually you're like, okay, like I need a rep team because I can't be like thinking about marketing. I can't be doing the cleaner schedule. I can't be dealing with the customer's complaints. I can't be answering the online chats and I can't be just like thinking about like how to grow the business. So I think like that's when I read the book, uh, The E-Myth, I think by Michael Garber. And it talks to you about like how, why small businesses fail. And I was like, okay, I need to read this book and study it because I don't want my business to fail. And I also don't want to just make another job for myself. I want to actually be like a owner of a company that has people that works for him. Mm. So there's so much that I can unpick there. And I know we're not, um, we could spend hours probably just talking about that business alone. The, the thing that I was most impressed by and, and kind of bringing it back to the title that I introduced at the beginning is the revenue growth in 18 months. I've got a note in front of me to say it went from zero to three million revenue in the first 18 months for made sailors. And you've just talked about that's th- those are really impressive numbers for any business and any entrepreneur, particularly with one of their first businesses. But for you, you're coming from this background of you're learning all of those skills on the fly during that first 18 months, lots of new skills. Even though you had this great experience from Silicon Valley and you had the development background, the entrepreneurial skills are all new and there's lots of new skills that you're learning. On the topic of marketing prioritization at that time, how were you prioritizing where to invest your marketing? And I say that also in context of the fact that although there's lots of demand there based on what you've just said, I would imagine that home cleaning in New York is a really competitive market. Yeah. And that's a good question because really when I was starting the maid company, I knew nothing about paid stuff, which is kind of what I do now, paid. But back then, all I knew was SEO. And I was really right. knew that because I was like, how do you find free traffic online? And that's when I thought about SEO. And, and I was like, okay, let me do anything I see. It, my, my Bible at that time was like moz.com. Um, I was on my website like 24-7 looking at Rand Fishkin's Twitter about like any SEO tips. And really on that niche was like a sub-niche of like local SEO, which is like we were just New York City based. And yeah. really the thing about us that worked really well was when we were launching made sailors, people probably know now, like when you search for like a local service, you see like the map listings. When I was starting the maid company, that was just coming out. And really we were able to capitalize on that when we started the clean company. So we were able to show up as like number one, two, one or two um, for like really early on. And then that inherently just got us a ton of traffic and a ton of bookings to our system just because I guess it was just early on. We're still like top three for those listings. But we now we have to keep, we actually work, need to work for that listing, the top listing. But before it was like much easier and really no one was like kind of like trying to do it. So when we came on, it was like one of those things like it just got, we just got lucky, right? It's like Google just launched this new thing and we were able to get on the top. But like, even though we weren't top three on Google, we were top three on this like local map thing that it just started showing up for all the users. And I remember when that first came out, like people in the forums were like, whoa, like my organic number one spot is not there anymore. And then you were like, yeah, because you, you're not actually like a local business. You're just like a sub page of a, of a local business. And we were an actual business in New York City. So Google at that time was promoting like l- true local businesses. There's a, again a little bit to unpack there. But what's interesting to me is that I. it sounds like you were at the right place at the right time with the right business when it comes to Google search and the features that were rolling out organically at that time. But also I'm curious to know, is it something that you spotted and then capitalized on? Or did you just notice it was happening on and then it just grew naturally? Yeah, no, it was definitely something that we spotted and then we saw. And I'm just like, oh, wow, this is crazy. Like, we're getting so much traffic. And I was just like, mm. I need to figure out. Like, and then I started just going on every single like, local SEO forum to try to know how to, how to get more of these like, local listings. And then that's when we started doing like, more local pages on our website. Yeah. And really, we... All, that's what I'm saying. Like after a while, all I focused on was like the SEO. I was like, okay, right. how do I keep our rankings high? Because this traffic and this volume is crazy. Like I've never seen this before. I'm like, I didn't realize that like Google will say like there's like a say search volume of 200. That's actually like much less than what there actually is. It's actually much more. I'm like, whoa! Like there's just so much traffic, and like 
that's when we have to really kick into gear of like hiring more people, hiring more staff. And at least for local businesses like us, the biggest thing is people call. People love calling. So we have to really ramp up our like our um, our call center. And initially we use like a call center. And but then we initially just then started hiring people to just take the phone calls in house because it was we were able to convert them much better. And then that's another lesson you just learned. Like, okay, how do you sell people on the phone? It's like a thing you just gotta learn. I'm like, okay, let me go watch some YouTube videos. Mm. So there's a few lessons that I'm learning from listening to you talk about this experience. The the first is that although there is an element of luck to what you said, being at the right the right place at the right time with the right features, you were learning and you were checking in with Moz regularly at least. So you were learning, so you you knew what to look out for. You knew the signs of growth, so that when you spotted the signs, you were able to capitalize them, capitalize on them. I think that's an important lesson to learn. The second, I guess, it sounds like you're an advocate for first mover advantage. So if there are any listeners out there that you know maybe you've spotted a trend or maybe you've spotted a new feature in a particular channel, double down and take advantage of it. There's evidence even on this podcast to show where that can work. And the third sounds like you were committed once you saw the signs of growth. The the third thing that stands out to me is that then you did double down on it. So you spent all of your time in that area. Yeah, no, exactly. And I and I, even even for me with that, like once I started realizing how powerful SEO was and like how strong it was like for our business, I then started thinking about like, hey, like if I'm like this position and I'm getting this amount of bookings, what happens if I'm like the third or fourth position? And then that's when I decided to go out and start buying other companies that were below me so I can own those local spots too in SEO because I was like, oh, like uh-huh. we're get all the spots. So then we went out to acquire like three to four other cleaning companies in our city and started ranking them in SEO. I think that's a great piece of advice as well. I'm going to move on to a very uh, the very similar topic, but then with Chester Travels. So this is your luggage company. Could we maybe introduce a little bit about that business to the listeners, the first year of growth, and then in a similar way, break down the marketing strategy for that first year? Yeah, so Chester Travels is a premium luggage company um, that we started a while ago. And really for this company, uh, this is my second e-commerce company that I started. And really the learning from... Why I started Chester was because before this, I had an outdoor gear company that we were, were, were that we're working on. It's still running. And then there were some clear like flaws in that business that we saw, such as the product was very easily made or copy, copyable by other people. So then we're like, okay, our product is selling, but we're seeing so much competition rise up. And also the product's pretty small, so it's not a hard product to ship overseas from China. So then when I was thinking about my second idea, I was like, What's a product out there that has a lot of volume? So luggages have a lot of volume on Google, but there isn't that many like what people call these days like D2C brands, right? So obviously there's Samsung and Tumi, but we wanted to come up with a product that was unique, custom, and also had a... uh, We really wanted to develop like a custom shell, a custom mold that no one else had so we can truly come out to the market and say, hey, look, we're this unique. And that's kind of how we started Chester. And to start start Chester, it took us about six months of development and R&D process until we got our first prototype. And then once we got our first prototype, that's when we started realizing we knew the channel we wanted to go for. And at this time, uh, Amazon uh, FBA was going to be the channel because at the, uh, when we, this was maybe a few years ago, no one, Amazon is still big now. Obviously, it was always been big. But back then, like a lot of brands such as Samsung or Toomey were like, oh, look, we're never going to go on Amazon because we're like a premium brand and Amazon's not seeing like a premium or a retailer, right? But obviously not true now. Almost everybody's on Amazon right now. So we then went to Amazon with our luggage and saw that the demand for a quality luggage that was high quality was so high. And then we just started doubling down the channel, getting better images, getting better photos, getting better product reviews. Uh, Double down on Amazon ads also just came out. So that was pretty cheap as well. And really the great thing about Amazon too right now, I'm not sure people know, but Amazon has ads almost everywhere. Like every. That'd be like listing is pretty much an ad on Amazon, which people think it's organic, but Amazon's just so crazy with like the advertising that for us, we really doubled down on, on that Amazon ads strategy. And, and even to like be, um, to previous Corona, like that's what we're doing. But then obviously Corona hit and like Amazon ads just completely went down for us because no one's buying luggages. What's interesting to me here is that there's obviously a trend that particularly since you left Silicon Valley and that journey since then is you, you talked earlier about you look at the research or you do the research to spot demand now and with made sailors and with chester travels it's all demand based you understand the demand to validate the idea and then you kind of launch into it 
Uh, I'm just curious, do you think there's anything about you in terms of your personal skills and characteristics that make you different to your peers, different to other entrepreneurs or marketers, or just something in you that makes it easier for you to spot demand? Uh, no, I, I, I think people all the time like, hey, like I'm just like Kevin. Like, There's nothing special or unique about me. Like, <laughs> I just tell people like, I just go and do it. And I tell people just like, just go and do it. Like, Figure out what there is that there's a demand for and just go and make the product like, like cleaning, right? I tell people all the time, like, I'm, I never clean the home, but like I have a cleaning company. I've never, I'm not a true hiker. I hike, but I have an outdoor gear company. I don't really travel that much or have a luggage company. I think when I was, so this is a girl goes back to sort of what some stuff I believed back then when I was like really into like the solar, Silicon Valley, like mentality was like, you have to be passionate in what you're building, right? I'm not passionate about these brands or what I'm doing. Like I love the companies that I've built, but I'm passionate about building a business and creating like a lifestyle that I want for myself and for like my future family, right? And that's where like that drives me is just like the, and also like the business aspect of building a company is pretty interesting because like this is just skills that you don't know about like, I'm building a company and like when you're like five people, it's much different than when you're 10 people, when you're 20 people. And that's kind of like, that's interesting to see like that growth and sort of like how you constantly need to be like learning more things. Um, it doesn't really matter what the company is per se about that. Just the business aspect of it. The practical element of, I think you said, you know, go away, figure it out, get something started. Practically speaking, and I know you're busy right now because you have multiple businesses and projects, but practically speaking, whether it's, whether it's these businesses or your work as a software developer, how do you practically spot demand in your day-to-day life? So for example, are you still on the front pages of product hunt? Is reading part of your daily activity? So reading news, is that still an obsession of yours? Yeah, so I still read news. Like I like looking at hacker news. Product hunt is great, a great way for products to come out. I, I really like checking Twitter. Twitter is really good. Um, but again, I really like to just like look look at things that like, I think I would use or I would think about, but other other great resources are just like other entrepreneurial friends. Everybody's always talking about ideas and things that they want to build too. So like you can always get ideas from them or just like I, I before COVID, I was always going to like um, just like marketing meetups or even like uh, founder talks. I think those are interesting. And I, and like I get ideas from just like listening to other people. I'm just like, Oh, that's a pretty interesting idea. I was like, Oh, that's, that's, that's a crazy, like, like, I just look at stuff that people write about. I'm like, oh, wow, it's crazy how much money they're making. I'm like, oh, maybe I can do something like that too, right? And that's how I get the idea. (laughs) Well, no, in a way, that's that's kind of answered my question is that it it sounds like your kind of unique ability is you you spot the demand and then you're very quick to move into if there's there's roots of an idea there that interest you and seem to motivate you, you very quickly launch into exploring it more. It sounds like you're not someone who procrastinates too much on ideas. No, yeah, no. I just like I tell people like like I've done like even for even before this, I wanted to do like an eyelash company where I was like, look, I actually like worked with like an eyelash company out in out in um out in Asia, right? And like I spent about 10k trying to do it, and then eventually I was like, oh, I don't really want to do it anymore. And, like we did the packaging, we did the we did the the samples, we did like the website, everything, and then eventually I was like, oh, I just like it's like I think that sort of like. Fear of not fail, uh, not, not not having the fear of failure is like uh, helps me just try things because I'm like, okay, if I waste 10k, at least I learned something about it. So I learned like how to do this like sort of packaging. I learned now how to ship things at this small. I learned how to talk to factories about like customization, and then that helped me with like Chester later on, right? So I think that concept of like, hey, yeah, you'll lose some money, but at the same time, really what you're gaining is more knowledge that no one can take from you. Mm. Yeah, no, that is really interesting, and. So that kind of transitions into you've you've had this experience of applying those skills to your own business and moving forward fast with your own own businesses, uh, but now you're the co-founder of an agency, Voy Media, and I want to know then how do you take those skills that you've learned and apply them to the clients that come to you? And the reason that I say that is because it's it's one thing to be able to move quickly on an idea of your own. But then to do that in the same way for a business where they've got their own dreams, ambitions, resources, obstacles, how do you still move fast and simplify marketing for those businesses that you're working with? And if you've got any examples, that, that would be great. Yeah, and I think, I think this was an interesting one too, because really the way I started the agency was because me and Will were like, hey, look, we have this experience of like us growing our own brands, us selling our own businesses, us acquiring businesses. 
I really want to come in as an agency to be unique in that way. Um, we never, like I said, we were never marketers. We never, we just learned marketing by doing our own stuff. So we wanted to work with founders that like understood that from us and then want to say like, Hey guys, I trust you. And that's really where like we wanted to do for Boy Media in the beginning. Quickly, we learned that that's not what people want, right? So <laughs> it's like people just like don't want to listen to you. So uh, because exactly what you said, they have their own dreams, their own ambitions, and their own view of the product or service that they're building. Um, so really, we've had to like transition a little bit about how we we say things or how we help them. That sort of says, "Hey, like I get what you're saying, but we really think that you should do it this way." And, and for example, we're working with one company and. They had a product they were selling, and the product they, the founders want to sell to like younger audiences, like very young audience, like hey, like you know, twenty to like thirty five, right? And we're doing campaigns for them, we're doing creatives for them, and we kept showing them like, hey, look, over and over, the people that are buying your products are not this age; they're more like fifty plus, and it just makes sense because the product was a great alternative to some sort of like knee pain that they were having. And literally for like a year, we kept telling this to the founders and like, no, like we don't want to sell to that that age group. We want to sell to like the younger group because I guess at the time it's like your brand, you want to like you don't want to be you know, I guess you don't want to be known to sell to like older demographic or they want to be mm-hmm. like hip, I guess. And finally, after like a year, we're just like, hey, can we just like experiment? Can we try like some photo shoots of older people with holding your products, holding your services, talking about your services? And then that's when the campaigns on Facebook just performed a lot better. And that's kind of where it's it's a hard mix of us telling them what to do because we're trying to figure it out too. It's like sometimes like I want to tell people like, hey, look, this is I know this is wrong, but how come you don't want to listen? And I can help you this way, but I don't know. It's it's hard. Like I, I it's something that we struggle every day, and we're trying to figure out like how do we answer that too. Yeah, it's interesting. It sounds like I guess one of the benefits that you have is the the diverse experience that you have working with different. I would say types of character and type of professional, both Silicon Valley and then also launching your own business is you have a breadth of experience and communication skills to be able to manage that. I guess actually one topic that we haven't spoken about throughout this entire process is selling. So it's one thing to build a great product. It's another to market a great product, but then to actually sell that product, you've managed to achieve that in businesses that you've worked in. So is that a skill that you've learned over time, those selling skills, those persuasion skills? Yeah, I mean, I learned most of the skills. So it's two ways, I think. I think I learned a lot more selling skills with with Voy Media because this is an industry where people are kind of skeptical about like agencies or just like people in this like field, right? So in here for Voy, I had to, I had to definitely learn more selling skills. So for Voy, I, uh, I I knew I was going to be on the phone all the time talking because I remember talking to one of my friends. He said like, as an agency owner, you would probably be better selling versus like a sales guy because like you people want maybe want to talk to you, Kevin, because of your expertise and your knowledge. So for this, I actually went to like, um, for over a year, I went to like a, a speaking coach on how to speak better. Um, I also went to improv comedy class for a year to just like know how to like answer questions on the fly. I also did another group like public speaking co- course era for a year as well. So I, and also just like did online courses about sales in order to like just get better at selling and just talking to people on the call based on like what they're saying, how they're talking to me and whatever, like it's called like sales acting, right? So I really put effort into trying to get better at it because I knew I wanted to like build this. And that's kind of like, that's kind of was exciting for me at the time because I was like, oh, I've never done this before. Like maybe I can be a good salesperson, but I've never, I always thought it was a scary thing because I don't think I'm, I'm thinking I'm an introvert. So uh, I I just learned that. But with the cleaning company, at least for made sellers, that was a little bit easier because people are just looking for a service. And now you're just kind of like providing them with the pricing and, and now trying to just say like, hey, now trust us with like, stuff so it wasn't when you when your product has a little bit more demand i think it's a little bit easier versus like an uh, industry that's a little bit more skeptical such as like an agency stuff mm, that's really interesting and there's some really valuable advice there particularly in learning more about public speaking you just said stand up comedy and whatever it is that you need to do to build rapport quickly with people particularly with stand up I'm, I'm interested in stand up comedy it's not a hobby of mine it's more of an interest but i always hear about from stand-up comedians about, you know, they've very quickly got to build rapport with an audience, otherwise everything falls flat. And so there's a lot to be said about what you can learn from stand-up comedians to build rapport quickly, which can benefit you as a a salesman or as a marketer as well. So I found that quite fascinating. I'm interested in this link to Shark Tank. Over in the UK, we have uh, an equivalent on BBC over here called Dragon's Den, so we don't get all of the the Shark Tank episodes um, on our kind of major TV channels. So could you maybe speak on the Shark Tank companies that you've worked with 
And I'm curious to know, how did you start working with them? So was it intentional that you tried to work with them or um, did it just happen by chance? Yeah, so we worked, so, so far we worked with about three, four different Shark Tank companies. And the first one was uh, a company that was like selling like a filter for uh, coffee that was on there. So Shark Tank, is like so many companies on right now. But really that was purely just accidental. They somehow, they somehow found us or one of our podcasts online and then they reached out to me. And they're just like, oh, hey, yeah, by the way, we're on Shark Tank. I was like, oh, my God, like, I need to somehow get you to work with me because this would be so good for our agency, right? And But working with them was interesting because it was interesting because, yes, they were on Shark Tank. But once you worked with them, it's like they're just like another typical founder. Like they trying to figure out like how to grow their product. Like Shark Tank is great. And I think something I've learned from all the companies we worked with and even other people that I talked to that have worked with Shark Tank companies is that like whenever the show airs, it's like, this big burst of traffic and sales. But then after that, like next day, it's just like flat lines. And then right. they still need to do marketing. So they still need to go to other agencies like us to figure out like, hey, uh, after the show airs, like what happens next? Because they still need to capitalize on this. And other companies that we work with right now too, like we'll see spikes in, in sales. And then we'll tell the founder like, it's like, oh yeah, like the show re-aired tonight. That's probably why we saw a bunch of sales. So like, that effect of Shark Tank is great for us, but it's also interesting to see like behind the scenes of like how companies on Shark Tank still truly need help marketing because it, they're just like any other business. It's except for like they have like this boost every once in a while. Well, that's really fascinating. And um, are there any uh, companies from Shark Tank that you wish you could have worked with uh, and you just haven't, or they're on your kind of to do list? You'd love to reach out to them and work with them. I would love to be like, actually, you know what companies are, I, I like Shark Tank, but I really like the other show. Like, have you, I'm not sure if you've seen like The the Profit. Have you seen that one? Uh, no, I've heard of it though. Yeah, I, I like the companies on there too, because I think those are like a lot of, like, I like Marcus Limones because like, he gives like, that's so, like that guy, like I like that because that's kind of where I want to be or do later on. It's like, look at like that. That's what we're mentioning for Boy Meeting. It's like, hey, look, we're going to come in and help you and invest in you and then make you better. And that's kind of like when I see that, I'm like, oh, that's that's kind of like what I wanted to do for Boy Media when I was first starting out with Wilson. But somehow we like just completely shifted to not doing that. So. Uh, funny you mentioned, but I can't remember the entrepreneur's name. Marcus, what was his surname? Lamones, Lamones, Lamones. It's it's funny you mentioned that because I have uh, I didn't know about him, but I was only reading about him this morning. So it's mm. fascinating that you should bring it up. I love it when my days come full circle. And so that's brought, the, that's brought my day full circle. I was reading about his work there was a US TV show that he used to work on where he would go in, buy businesses, turn them around. I just can't remember what it was called. And I was reading about that this morning. Um, I have one final question just about your time at Void Media and where you're at in life now. And I was thinking about, so I speak to lots of different companies all around the world, but I was speaking, thinking specifically about the fact your, uh, your location, you're in New York City. And I was wondering whether there's any unique challenges to being an agency in New York City that you're aware of or benefit. And the reason I say that is it's in context of the fact that for me as a marketer, definitely at least in the 50s, 60s, you know, that Mad Men era, yeah. New York City was, it still held with that certain prestige in marketing and advertising. Does it still feel that same way for you? Are there any other locations around the world that you could see Voy Media expanding into? Yeah, I think it's so funny you said that because at least for us in the space, like the guys like doing the agencies, I think it's it's like, oh, it's just New York City and like, you know, we're just used to it. But when clients come on or clients call us and they see they know that we're from New York City, they're just like, Oh, well, like you're you're from New York City, like the best agency in the in the in like the best place to be an agency, right? So they have that law, which is great for us because it helps us, you know, close deals essentially. Um, because there is that like oh my God, like Mad Men type of esque feeling that you get that they get when they work in an agency firm. So we get a lot of people like that. Just say, hey, I really want to work with an agency from New York City and you guys are in New York City. You guys are good. Let me work with you guys. So that, that's a benefit. Uh, but then there's also the negative side effect is like, our t- yes, our team is based in New York City. Like half our team is here. But Wilson, who's our other partner, he's in Asia. And so he has also have, has another team that's also built around the world. So sometimes clients will like, sign with us and i'm like oh wait but like you're gonna get a guy from like you know germany and they're just like wait i thought i was working with someone from the new york city right so like that sometimes is a clash of like uh thought ideology and then like them upset and this was like maybe before this whole COVID thing but now that this whole COVID thing we never hear that issue anymore because like oh yeah it makes sense that no one's working from the office right 
Ah, yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it from that angle before, but it's almost like there's so much prestige associated with New York City that they don't want to work with someone beyond that, and that's an obstacle. I hadn't thought about it that way. No, yeah. That's really that's a really unique insight. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a very it's very interesting because I I remember having to talk to two clients after they had signed. They're like Kevin, like we need to talk. I'm like, what happened? Like I thought we were working with someone from New York. I'm like, you are working with our company, but like the the person that's managing your account is better, and he manages clients like you. From, but it doesn't live in New York City, and I'm like, I'm like, just give them a shot, and they're like, oh, and then like after a month, they're like, yeah, like okay, that makes sense, right? It's like like anything, like you probably know too, like with, it's all results based. So once the results are like, oh yeah, now they're now they're happy again. <laughs> and um, in in closing for this episode today, we've talked a lot about demand, uh, and it's the thread throughout this episode. And I just want to close with a question on: I couldn't speak to you. You're someone that seems to have their finger on the pulse of marketing and business trends. I want to know what's demanding your attention at the moment. So are there any trends in the world, marketing or business, maybe SaaS, that have got your attention and, and, and have caught your eye? Yeah, I think the biggest the biggest one for me right now that we're working on too, me and Wilson, is just building our own like supplements brand. And we're mm. seeing supplements as like a, a thing that like it's just interesting space because we're seeing some of the we're seeing some of like these really great tactics that are working so well that I haven't seen work for like other spaces that I've done. So like I've done obviously local service, e-commerce, and we're building our supplements company right now. And I'm just seeing like long form sales copy, long form VSLs, video sales letters, yeah. uh, upsell funnels, downsell funnels, like one click email upsells or like that's that's really what I'm thinking about at the moment right now. And it's something that like the reason why I like supplements too is because we did a we did a lot of research on supplements and we're seeing that like the the profit margin is so high compared to like a bigger item, like for example, a luggage, right? Like it's mm-hmm. more easier to ship a little bottle, but also your profit margin is probably like 200, 20% higher than a luggage that has like this huge storage fees. They have this huge shipping fees. Um, so that's kind of like, it's like, it's like I told before, it's like, I'm like, I'm building all these businesses, but I'm also like getting insights into like, oh, like my next company, I don't want to do that because of this thing that I'm seeing at this current company. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the supplements industry is something that I could speak about forever. But unfortunately, we're, we're, we're out of time for this episode today. Maybe in the future, if that, uh, we'll see where that leads for you in your future. And maybe you can come on the podcast in the future and talk about how successful your supplements businesses have been. That's a good, uh, that's a good goal for the vision board. Kevin, you've been an amazing guest. Thank you for taking the time out to talk to me today uh, about you, your history and your tips for simplifying marketing and making it more efficient. Before I let you go, do you want to let our listeners know where they can connect with you, find out more about you? Yeah, so if everybody wants to email me, it's just Kevin at Void Media or voidmedia.com. But I'm also, I like to use Twitter a lot, so just twitter.com forward slash Danis, D A N E S T, and you can just message me there as well. Brilliant. Hey, thanks so much for your time, and uh, I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Brilliant. Take care. Bye bye.